Good afternoon, everyone. We'll just give everyone a few more seconds to join. I see the attendee list is rapidly increasing there. So we'll just give a few more seconds. Okay, so I think we'll make a start. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us. And welcome to our webinar that's going to look at fintech uh, trends and developments in Ireland and Europe. My name is Mark Adair, and I'm a partner in the technology team at Mason, Hayes & Curran here in Dublin. My practice has a particular interest in e-payments contracts, data security, and blockchain. So today, I'm particularly looking forward to hearing our panelists talking about some of the issues in this area. But how can we not start by saying what a year we've had? COVID-19, Brexit, working from home, Zoom, disputed presidential elections, to name but a few. But we've got a really great panel of speakers lined up for you today who are going to help explore some of these challenges in the fintech landscape, as well as the really exciting opportunities for the future of the sector. So to kick things off, I wonder if each of our panelists could briefly introduce yourselves and let us know what you do. And I might start with you, Byron. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Byron Fry, and I represent uh, IDA Ireland's uh, Financial Services Division UK. IDA Ireland is Ireland's Inward Investment Promotion Agency. And in London, I work with uh, all four regulated financial services firms to uh, evaluate Ireland as a location and help them expand there. And John? Sure. Hi, everyone. John O'Brien, Senior Legal Counsel with Revolut, focusing on privacy and data protection. Um, Revolut is um, one of the world's fastest growing fintech scale-ups. We have 13 million customers around the world, uh, 1 million of whom are in Ireland. Thanks, John. And my partner, Rowena? Hi hey everyone, uh, my name is Rowena Fitzgerald. I'm a lawyer and I'm a partner specialising in financial services regulation in NHC. My practice is quite broad and the team and I advise on various areas such as enterprise licensing for payment and money institutions, investment firms, insurers, brokers, anyone who might need a licence from the central bank. We also advise on ongoing regulatory obligations um, and how to deal with say the likes of central bank enforcement actions and inspections. And we do a lot of advisory work for clients. So for some clients, they're keen to stay out of the regulated space and we help those clients navigate the scope of regulation and perhaps structure their business so that they don't need a license to engage in the activities they want to engage in. And with that in mind, we do a lot of work with fintech companies, both those that are looking for a license from the central bank, as well as those who are looking to avoid the scope of regulation. Thanks, Rowena. And last but not least, Colin. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, my name is Cullum Lyons. I'm the founder and CEO of identity verification company IDPAL. IDPAL enables businesses to verify the identity of the customers in a, in a simple, secure and convenient manner. Um, we're an Irish company. We were founded in 2016. Um, our customer base ranges from very much from SME customers up to, up to large corporates. Um, the solution was used last year in 43 countries. Uh, we have a number of strategic household partners like the likes of Temenos and Salesforce on our platform. So looking forward to, to the next hour, Mark. That's fantastic. You're all very welcome. So I just want to start off by looking at the current state of the sector and the trends that you're all seeing. Uh, Byron, you're probably best placed from the perspective of the IDA to give us an overview of the state of the fintech ecosystem here in Ireland. Uh, yes, thank you. So I suppose starting at a very uh, top macro level, um, Ireland went into this uh, current crisis with uh, one of the most resilient economies in the OECD with 79% uh, of Ireland's economic output uh, being attributed to uh, sectors deemed least affected by COVID. Um, we also had one of the highest rates of remote working in the EU uh, which was 7% uh, versus an EU average of 5% going into this crisis. So as a consequence of this, fintechs across the country have actually demonstrated a remarkable resilience and flexibility. Um, and we've actually many IDA client fintechs actually experiencing uh, positive growth 
um, during this time as, uh, as their end base are accelerating uh, their shift uh, to digital services. Um, COVID has also accelerated uh, restructuring programs within mature financial institutions as well. Um, this is a continuation of what we saw during Brexit as well, uh, where firms still reading from the effects of the first financial crisis are still raised to reduce costs and gain a competitive edge by uh, adopting new technologies and introducing process automation where possible. Um, at IDA, um, we've uh, investment activity uh, largely delayed uh, during the, the first half of the year during the spring lockdown, um, but we've seen a, a lot of pent up demand actually being released um, now during the autumn and going into winter. And, and we do expect a, a strong, uh, strong pipeline going into 2021 of investment activity and are continuing to field um, inquiries into uh, areas such as R&D centers, uh, tech-driven activities, um, such as, I suppose, uh, data analytics, uh, developing digital uh, portals, for instance, um, and, and looking at uh, introducing AI um, uh, amongst other activities. Um, Ireland also continues to be a popular location for UK fintechs to expand to. Uh, we've, been, we've seen a vast increase in the number of payments in e-money licenses being issued by the BI since Brexit. Uh, modular finance most recently uh, um, being uh, receiving an e-money license last month, uh, taking the total to 16, and uh, SecPay relief receiving a payments license in uh, September as well, bringing the number of payment licenses in the jurisdiction up to 21. Um, you know, pretty most, if not all of them, have been uh, awarded uh, since Brexit. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Byron. And John, Byron mentioned some of the recent challenges that we've all faced in 2020. Um, before March, I guess, very few of us had six different video conferencing apps on our mobile phones. Um, could you walk us through some of the ways that Revolut has been trying to negotiate challenges like COVID and Brexit uh, over the last sort of nine to 12 months? Sure. Um, hopefully most people on this call um, have the Revolut app on their phone. For those <laughs> who don't, we, we kind of uh, look to position ourselves as a fintech super app which means that we offer um, a competitive retail banking. Um, and I think, you know, COVID has been extraordinarily tough for every organization on the planet. And it's been no different for Revolut. You may have seen, we provide kind of hyper time transaction data to governments around the world to help them craft their response to COVID. And that's been really interesting for me because um, obviously I work on the privacy and data protection side of things. But, you know, we've seen huge changes in how people are spending their money and the organizations with which they are banking. So, you know, nobody's traveling anymore. So companies like Revolut are making less money on FX fees, but we've had incredible growth in areas like um, commodities, share trading, crypto. It's been a real move um, that, you know, I think maybe perhaps we didn't uh, anticipate at the start of the year pre-COVID. So it's been a very interesting year. I think we have seen that spending has definitely rebounded, certainly into Q4. It'll be interesting now to see what happens in the UK as we had into the lockdown and what happens in Ireland as you got kind of reached the midpoint of the second lockdown but huge change and I don't think anyone the day for um, not making great predictions or the, the, the day after the <laughs> night before not making great predictions. Yeah yeah absolutely and I think a lot of us are going to be tired from staying up and watching the, the presidential elections that's true. Um, Colm I think our audience will be interested as an indigenous fintech um, the trends that you're seeing and what do you think is driving these trends? Is it user experience or are there some other factors at play? Yeah, I think, I think, it's, I think it's very evident in the market that you know, there's, there's more and more startups, more and more scale-ups that are, that, that are out there than, than there was ever before. And you know, if you look at any business or organization, uh, these innovation hubs seem to, be, seem to be part and core of, of, of their DNA. Um, you have accelerator programs you know, grow, growing across the world, especially, especially in Ireland. Um, you know, and all these all these opportunities. I think what gives these opportunities and the ability is 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 the backing. And um, you know, and Enterprise Ireland obviously will be one of one of Europe's biggest backers for for startups. Um, and I think people are people are looking at things very different. Um, and I think people are looking at things outside outside the box. Um, and they're looking at companies that um, startups and scaleups that have actually are starting to achieve and are in the news and are in the press. Um, and they're beginning to think themselves that okay, if, if this is possible, I'm, I'm actually going to follow my own dreams. And um, so I think it's I think it's I think it's brilliant to see. I think it's really exciting to see. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm obviously I speak with a lot of founders every day. Um, I haven't seen a slowdown from COVID in terms of people looking to come up with new 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 ideas. 
Um, but for me, and I suppose maybe linked to the, the business that I'm in, it all goes back to user experience. And, you know, and any company that I, that I speak with, or any founder that I speak with, and I ask them where, where they came up with the idea, it was always, I was doing this, or I was working at this. And it's all from pers- pers- personal experience, but a lot of it's down to that actual user experience. Um, I read a report last week from, from Anne Bowden, um, who's the CEO of Starling Bank. Um, you look at Star- Starling Bank as a challenger bank, um, very successful as, as, as they were. So I think COVID has just accelerated it for them. Um, but she was very much on, on the vein that user experience is, is everything. That is what's driven their product to it. Um, so yeah, I, think, I definitely think that that idea of user experience is, is the core for, for, for change right now. Mm-hmm. That, that's a real fascinating insight. Um, so as well as the, the, the trends on the technology side, Rowena, you must come across a lot of different legal and regulatory issues in your practice. So what are the, the regulatory developments that your clients are encountering? And do you think regulators can keep pace with how fast the technology is developing? Yeah, thanks, Mark. I think, I suppose, to begin in terms of, say, challenges that I'm seeing in the area that I work in for fintech firms, I think these can be split into two areas when it comes to regulation. Firstly, for those new entrants that might be looking to get a license from the central bank to do what they're doing, so whether that's payments, e-money, MIFID, I think one of the biggest challenges that those kind cost and the effort of regulation. So there's a lot of responsibility that goes with holding a license issued by the central bank. And firms shouldn't underestimate the amount of work and cost that goes into successfully getting their app or getting their license from the central bank. The second challenge, and this applies to everyone, so the big established firms to the new entrant, um, that's trying to keep up with the pace of regulatory changes and developments. And to give you an example of that, Obviously, fintech is a feature of every business these days. Um, and like Colin mentioned, I think COVID has given firms the, the push to digitalize and bring everything online as well. And the central bank is placing more and more emphasis on technology. And anyone who's tuned in, who operates in the regulated space, will know that over the past few years, the central bank has really, really been focusing on this area. And in the more recent past, the central bank has focused on cybersecurity um, and firms' abilities to keep their systems and information safe. Um, and that topic is actually being considered at an EU level at the moment as well. And then more recently, the central bank has introduced a new role, um, a new pre-approval controlled function role for the role of chief information officer. And that, I think, that step really demonstrates that the central bank knows how crucial technology matters are for firms. And it's, acknowledge, it's an acknowledgement that the person who is in charge of IT matters within a regulated entity is part of the firm's senior management and is someone whose actions can have a direct impact on the firm's risk profile. So I think they're the big regulatory challenges as I see them for fintech. Firstly, it's the, the cost and the effort of getting regulated for, for new entrants. And then secondly, it's trying to keep up with regulatory pace as things develop and change. Mm-hmm. And Colin, moving to yourself, IDPAL isn't a regulated entity in of itself, but most, if not all of your clients are. So you're really at the core face of this. So I'm wondering, do you, do you see the same compliance hurdles that Rowena sees? And if so, can technology help overcome these hurdles? Yeah, and I think I think I think I think it's important to, to recognize, you know, our, our industry doesn't need to be regulated. However, it's you know, as our clients are regulated entities, we need to stay close to the regulators. And um, we've met with the, the Central Bank of Ireland a number of times. We've had very positive engagements with them. Um, and it's you know, there, there's an element of within within technology and within a regulator and even within a business, it's it's a two-way, two-way learning curve. And um, you know, the, the pace of change right now within technology is, is staggering. Um, you know, even, even for a fintech company like ourselves to, to keep up with the pace of change, it's, it's difficult. And, um, you know, we have, what, GDPR, PSD2, AMLD5, 4, 5, 6, you know, they, they, they're, they're coming thick and fast and it's, it's mm. extremely hard for businesses to, to, to keep up with, with, with actually the pace of change. And um, I, I think it's important to recognize as well, though, that where, where business will always, you know, they, they, they feel that they may struggle with the, with the technology side of things um, and struggle with keeping up to the pace of change. It's as equally difficult for, this, for, the, for the regulator to actually keep up with the pace of change as well and make sure that their legislation adheres to, to actually what's out there and what's available within the market. So, 
And um, you know, I think I think having that collaborative nature between between businesses and 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 the regulators is is, is extremely important. Um, you know, c- companies can't can't outsource the risk. They are the risk owner for them for themselves. Um, and what they're doing is they're they're moving towards technology to try and enable them to to move to move to a stage or to move to a place that they can use technology not to outsource the risk, but to enable them to put them into a better place. Um, you know, one of the, one of the one of the key things I see and the difference that I've seen in the last twenty four months to to where it was a couple of years ago is actually the decision makers. Um, definitely within our business, the decision makers seem to be not your head of product. Um, not your technology people, not your operations people, but it's now actually the the, the compliance people. And I think that's that's a that, that's a big shift in in, in thinking as well. Um, mm. It's probably something that 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 regulators will enjoy to hear. And um, that compliance people have more of a say now, and they're they're not just the the, the traditional idea of um, saying no to everything. And um, you know they do say they do say no for for genuine reasons. But um, I think it's, it's an interesting thing that that shift has moved to, to compliance people making decisions. And John, Colin mentioned the GDPR there, and I don't think we can do a a webinar about fintech and the the legal and regulatory issues without mentioning GDPR, because a lot of the value that's in a fintech is in the data it holds and the the value that can be extracted from that data. Uh, I'm interested in how Revolut approaches navigating the compliance with the requirements of GDPR versus the the business need of of unlocking that value in the data. Yeah, absolutely. I think... um... There probably hasn't been a, a regulatory webinar in the fintech space that hasn't mentioned GDPR over the last two years. Brexit will be next. Someone else will have to talk about Brexit. But those are the two big things that keep us in house, house lawyers very busy. Um, and yeah, look, my job is Privacy Council um, for Revolut. So my job is about embedding privacy by design at every stage of what we do. And I completely agree with what Colin and Rowena said. You know, Revolut is um, a licensed regulated entity. And, you know, the, um, I guess the challenge is between innovation and regulation. You know, and it's up to me as in-house counsel to kind of ensure that we are doing everything that we ought to be doing under the various regulations, including GDPR. Um, and that can be frustrating sometimes because you're working with people who want to revolutionize how we bank. And, you know, it's, it's often kind of you have to bring them on the journey with you to explain why it is important that we kind of comply with things like GDPR. So my entire job is about embedding a culture of privacy by design throughout the life cycle. And Revolut is a personal data company. You know, we are a data company. We use data to understand what our customers want and to deliver it to them in the right medium at the right time. Um, So it's super challenging. And I would completely echo what Rowena said in terms of, you know, never underestimate the challenge of regulation in the fintech space. And it should be regulated. It should be very highly regulated because people are trusting us with their money. Um, So my job is an interface between the likes of, you know, the Data Protection Commissioner or the ICO in the UK and our product teams to ensure that we're continuing to break down walls and offer innovation whilst also complying with all relevant regulation. That's fascinating, John, thanks. I'd like to now turn to the the tech in fintech. Um, Byron, most of us have come across virtual currencies and cryptocurrencies as one of the sort of uh, technical uh, advances in, in the sector. And I read a piece in the Financial Times recently on central bank virtual currencies. So I'd love to get your view on the technological developments like this that you're seeing. And if you think there's any more room for innovation left. Absolutely, Mark. Um, so I think to answer the uh, answer your, uh, your questions in reverse, I think absolutely a lot of, uh, I think we're really at the beginning of uh, this this technological race between financial institutions. And I mean, if anything, the, uh, the pace of innovation is, is only accelerating as uh, I suppose the, um, the, the gathering and accessibility of data uh, just becomes easier and more, more widespread and we develop more um, advanced analytical techniques to, uh, to digest this data and gain new insight. Really for cutting is, is going to be in who, who can generate the best insights in, in their data and who's got the best, uh, the data, the best data infrastructure to compete uh, on a global scale. Um, what we're seeing also, I mean, COVID, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, has uh, really accelerated uh, the, uh, the adoption of uh, digital technologies uh, right across the board. Um, you know, whether that's basically improving a website where a client, uh, you know, the client database uh, with the company or, uh, developing uh, internal interface, interfaces for employees to go in and quickly gather 
uh, smart data insights on, uh, on customers, for instance, that they're working with. Um, we've also seen uh, a rapid demise now as well of, uh, well, not demise, but rather a diminishing of use cash, uh, uh, a quick diminishing as well of the use of physical bank branches uh, as, as examples. And with the entrance of the likes of Revolut as well, um, again, accelerating towards, uh, towards the uh, digital distribution of, uh, of, of personal banking services. And, and you know, we're seeing this uh, as a continued uh, trend uh, throughout COVID as well, where uh, you know, we're hearing of, of uh, strong client acquisition growth across the, uh, the challenger banking space. Um, I guess in addition to that as well, uh, you know, we're also seeing a mass rollout of uh, robo-advisory tools uh, that continues to be uh, in uh, interest from UK financial institutions to engage with uh, our research centres as well, develop uh, what we call CX, which is effectively the next generation of customer services, uh, which stands for customer experience. So something like robo-advisory tools would fit very neatly into that as uh, uh, firms are developing uh, new techniques to uh, engage with clients en masse whilst keeping the cost down. Um, touching on the data analytics as well, um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, AI is a massive theme and the adoption of um, uh, data analytics techniques such as machine learning, uh, developing neural networks as well, um, have uh, proved very popular. And again, we're um, introducing clients to research centers such as uh, Center of Applied uh, Data Analytics at uh, University College Dublin uh, to develop these kind of uh, proof of concept um, uh, data analytics um, uh, structures. Um, coupled with all of this, data uh, storage on the cloud um, has become pretty much the norm now as well. People have shifted away from physical servers as they're uh, grappling with going reams of data. You know, we're talking, you know, how Revolut we're talking about um, all this live customer data that they're handling. Um, you know, all of this really now has to take place on the cloud, just given the exponential growth of uh, data that's being gathered. Um, and, uh, and I guess that also then ties in with uh, uh, the, the challenges around uh, by GDPR and uh, potential hard Brexit as well, and the questions that arise around the location of this data as well. So storing this data on the cloud has effectively outsourced uh, that, that, that problem to specialist third party providers like Microsoft Azure and Amazon. Uh, touching on your point about digital currencies. Um, so, you know, I think we're maturing of this sector as well, moving away from uh, you know, Bitcoin and, uh, you know, many of the other cryptocurrencies that uh, arose over the previous year, actually seeing central banks taking technology very seriously with the likes of uh, the ECB, uh, the, uh, the Japanese Central Bank and the Fed all exploring uh, this technology as well. ECB uh, actually uh, released a white paper uh, very recently as well, uh, talking about the potential benefits of creating a digital euro. And uh, this would, uh, some primary bits would uh, focus on areas like um, improving uh, cross-border payments uh, to particular locations uh, where, where it's been slow to transfer money in the past um, and uh, introducing other uh, further efficiencies, but also maintaining the euro's global relevance and competitiveness as other central banks uh, seek to be the first to um, uh, roll out digital currencies uh, themselves. Um, and and Thanks, in this, to, just to so, wrap up on this, yeah, go, go ahead, Byron. Feel free to wrap up. Yeah, yeah. Wrap up on this point just by saying that Ireland actually has become a hotbed of innovation in this space, uh, with the likes of Mastercard, Census, and Fiserv, amongst others, uh, locating their blockchain, uh, global blockchain R and D operations in Ireland as well. So, um, you know, from a, a fintech development perspective, I think Ireland is very well positioned to continue to uh, to capture um, uh, to, to develop um, this this the digital currency space. Mm -hmm. Um, and the only thing I'd say is, as long as the robo advisors don't become robo legal advisors and put John Rowena and myself out of business, we'll we'll be okay. Um, okay. Colin, uh, Byron mentioned AI there, and I think AI is a ve very interesting topic, and it's one that I I'm sure you come across at uh, IDPAL, um, whether it's machine learning, speech recognition, or something else. W what do you think AI means for the sector? Yeah, so you know we. Within IDPAL, we, we use AI, we use machine learning, we use biometrics, we use blockchain. We've we've got all the buzzwords going on in with, within our company, and you know, and it is it is extremely hard to keep up with with those advances and, and changes. And um, you know, I think you, you you mentioned when you were asking Byron, and I agree with Byron's point is that we are very much at the start of technological change. 
um, you know, and I think when you were asking the question around, is, is there room for change? Is there, is there still room for innovation? Um, I was asked to use a fax machine last week. So I think that will, that will tell us all that we're, we're, we're still at the very, very early stages of, of, of where we're at. Um, you know, AI is, AI is, is extremely important. Um, every, everything, you know, I'm reading it in papers saying technology is going to replace people. Um, I don't. I don't believe that for a minute. You know, innovation starts with people. That's that's where it comes from. Um, it's it, it's humans. It's that's 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 the bedrock of it. Um, and AI is just there to to improve the processes that are actually that are actually happening. Um, so you know, we're 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 in a position where we're not going to lose jobs because of technology. Um, we're not going to lose the the market shares of this world. But you know the the heavy lift of some of the stuff that you may have to do will will be improved, and your process will be improved. Now it'll allow you to spend more time on the the high net worth um, things that you do in your in your in your day to day. Um, I think there 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 will be a big change with AI in terms of um, people and their data. Um, I think I think that's that that's one thing that that, that we will see over, over over the next number of years. I think people are far more aware of their own personal data. Um, how it's managed, how it's tracked, um, and the access that people actually have to that. So I think I think there's a lot, an awful lot more room for improvement um, within 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 data and uh, and people. Mm. John, from the perspective of Revolut, is there a fintech tech trend that's emerged this year or over the last eighteen months that wasn't on your radar in previous years that that surprised you? I mean, yeah, I mean, fintech wasn't on my radar because I only joined the company in January. So it's all been a steep learning curve for me. Um, I think two things, one on a macro scale, um, you know, I think my generation is never going to go back to in branch banking. We're never going to go back to five hours a week availabilities, five days a week. Um, you know, and I think if you look at the Netflix and Spotify's of the world, it, banking is ripe for that kind of innovation. I think that's why we've seen such initial success with Revolut and our challenge now is to mature. What do we do next? What's our next step? You know, we won't really be competing with the big banks until people trust us with their salaries and their mortgages and their personal loans. So that's something that we're really aiming for whilst also driving innovation all the time. You know, we've launched really innovative products like Revolut Junior for kids under the age of 17, stuff that, you know, traditional banks aren't doing. So I think that's kind of my macro point. And I will completely agree with what Colin says on the micro point, which is my area of specialty, personal data. Um, I think there's been a trend this year in terms of people knowing their rights, people wanting to assert their rights and regulators expecting companies like Revolut and other financial institutions to adhere to the GDPR and to answer things quickly. Um, and I think COVID somewhat interrupted that. In the UK, you know, regulators gave some of the bigger banks some time off from answering data subject mm -hmm. access requests. Um, and it's an area of particular pride for me that Revolut didn't have to take the ICO up on that offer. You know, we pride ourselves in responding to data protection requests as quickly as we would, you know, a financial ombudsman request. So um, there's been a lot of change over the last 18 months and an awful lot of change since I joined just in January. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to now move on to the opportunities and some of the predictions for the future. And I think this, this is a, a really interesting topic that everyone's going to have a view on. Rowena, from your perspective of the sort of financial services regulation in Ireland, in the EU, what do you think the future is? I'd be interested to know, do you think we're going to see more harmonization? And also, is there a risk that too much regulation could actually hinder the development of fintech companies? Yeah, thanks, Mark. I'd agree with the second part. I think there is a risk that too much regulation can hinder development, but Look, as things stand, I think it's fair to say that regulation, it's only going to go one way and that's in favour of more rather than less regulation. Um, saying that, it does take regulators time to catch up in certain areas. I'm sure John probably sees this new role in Revolut where you would have problems with, you know, dealing with new products and innovation and then trying to fit them back into existing or perhaps outdated regulatory frameworks. And I think a prime example of more recent innovation is in the area of um, the regulation of virtual and cryptocurrencies that, that Byron spoke about. And to date, vanilla cryptocurrencies have fallen outside the scope of regulation. And when I say vanilla, I mean those cryptocurrencies that they're just currencies. They don't involve a derivative of some kind, so they're not a financial instrument. And these types of currencies are now only starting to come in scope of regulation. Um, and as, as Colm 
mentioned, we're, we're going on to the fifth anti-money laundering directive, um, and Ireland has been slow in transposing that. We're behind time, and we've been slow in transposing all of the other um, anti-money laundering directives to date as well. But it is on track, and a bill has been published to transpose that legislation. And as part of that, previously unregulated virtual asset providers and custodian wallet providers um, will now be brought in scope of anti-money laundering regulation and they have to carry out customer due diligence obligation and do the same checks as other financial service providers have to do and that's where the likes of Cullum's firm ID pal will be in a prime position to, to help those clients. Um, at a European level there are plans to regulate cryptocurrencies more broadly uh, and very recently the European Commission has published a digital finance package which includes a proposal for regulation, which would create a wholesale regulatory framework for crypto assets um, that contemplates strict requirements for issuers, including a requirement for, for issuers to apply for authorization to provide their services. Um, and like existing regulated entities, if that proposal becomes law, those crypto asset service providers will have to have a physical presence in the EU. They'll be subject to prudential and organization requirements in the same way other regulated financial services providers are. And they'll have to safe keep clients' funds in the same way that the banks and payment firms have to do at the moment. So I think in general, we're definitely going towards a trend of more rather than less regulation. And with like with, we have with all areas of financial services regulation in Europe, there's also a push towards further harmonization in this space. Colm, turning to you, as the CEO of a fintech firm that's living through this, the, the current situation and everything we've talked about, what learnings do you take from what's happening in the world at the minute? And where do you see the future of the fintech sector going? Yeah, so, I think I think the first thing everyone was looking at back in March was their business continuity plans. Um, I don't think anyone anyone for one minute envisaged something like this happening. You know, when, when you're looking at your business continuity, you're you're not thinking that you're in a movie scene that you can't move within two kilometers of, of your house. And um, so I think that's something that's that's going to be a big change for a lot of companies uh, move, moving forward. And um, I would definitely agree with Rowena um, that in terms of the the, the AML side of things. I think that that common framework across across um, different jurisdictions and different industries is extremely important. And um, you know, we we talk with and we deal with regulated entities every day. And um, there's a lot of frustration there because it's not black and white in terms of what they can and what they should do. So I could speak to two completely same companies, and they would have different interpretations of exactly what they're meant to be doing. So having that common framework, I think, is extremely important, and I definitely see changes like that happening. And um, the, the, the transfer of data, um, I think, is a very interesting one, and it goes back to what I was touching on earlier in regards to people and their own personal data. Um, I'm sure everyone everyone is aware of the the, the SEC ruling and the standard contractual clauses with Facebook um, over, over the last number of months. Um, and I think that there's, there's a lot of op opportunity there for the, for the transfer of data and how that's actually going to be, be managed and used going forward. Um, and I suppose then on a on a slightly lighter lighter topic um, would be more around how, how we socialize and how we actually work. Um, I think there's a lot of people jumping on the idea that we will always work from home um, going forward. Um, you know, and I think John John kind of touched on it. It's definitely going to be different. Um, I don't think it's going to be that everyone's going to be working home for, 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 for here on in. Um, but it's only for the betterment, I think, that people will have the flexibility. Um, to work three days in the office, two days at home and things like that. But there's definitely going to be a lot of change and there's a lot of opportunity within the fintech space um, because, you know, every, every, every time something happens, it brings, it brings a problem and all those problems can actually be solved. Um, and technology is, is one of those core drivers that can actually solve those problems. So I do, I do see a lot of opportunity. I'd say there's a lot of people sitting at home, uh, putting plans together, putting ideas together in terms of how they can actually and improve uh, with, with the likes of COVID in, in the back of their mind. John, I don't know if you want to make a comment on the, the data transfer, if you do feel free. Um, and also my question to you would be, what, what's in store for the payment sector and what's the future? Do you think we'll see more diversification in offerings or will we see uh, a convergence in things? Sure. Um... 
just on data transfers, data transfers are huge. Brexit is huge for us. We're a London headquartered company. As I said, we are, I view us as a data company. I would, I'm the data lawyer. Um, it, it is absolutely huge for us. And I don't see any um, financial institution having a perfect solution to this at the moment. And I think we're all gonna be finding our feet in Q1 of next year because of Brexit and because of the Trends decision. Two, um, I guess, I was going to say kind of um, predictions for the future, but I will caveat with the fact that I also bet on Joe Biden to win big last night. So <laughs> I might be the best person to make predictions. One, innovation is going to continue. Companies like Revolut are not going away. They're going to keep innovating and that's going to cause, you know, the bigger retail banks to also start innovating. And I think, you know, we've definitely seen evidence of that in the UK. And I, I do think there'll be a consolidation. I think there's an awful lot of startups or, you know, early, st early stage um, scale-ups who maybe, you know, have been hit hard by COVID, who are doing really interesting things and they were just hit at the wrong time with this pandemic. And I think you'll have a lot of established financial institutions looking around, knowing that they need to innovate more, perhaps not having the structures in place, knowing how to innovate, and perhaps some of those startup scale-ups would be ripe for the picking. So I think there'll be consolidation in terms of some of the bigger players, perhaps acquiring some of these smaller startups um, but I think innovation is definitely here to stay. And the final question of the session to Byron, we, we'll have time for, for a bit of Q&A after this, but the, the, the final question for me, uh, Byron, and I think you'll have an interesting take on this. What's been done to encourage the fintech industry in Ireland? And I guess we're all stakeholders. Um, so what more can we all do to play our part in helping to develop it? Well, there's a, it's a very rapidly evolving ecosystem in Ireland. There's a lot of things which can be done to support it. So I'll, I'll focus on four key areas. Um, I think um, really taking a kind of a long-term view and a bottom-up approach, uh, focusing on developing and growing the, uh, the existing talent pool in Ireland uh, to foster the growth of fintechs, I think is absolutely fundamental. This is really one of the major uh, driving forces when uh, companies are assessing a jurisdiction is can they get this high level, this high quality um, talent? Because this, this talent companies are searching for it on, you know, on global scale, so aren't really competing globally and, uh, and it really needs to position it uh, as, as a high value, high skill um, uh, location. So to this end, uh, continued investment in STEM subjects, both at secondary and tertiary level, I think is absolutely fundamental uh, to, to foster an interest and to develop the skill set uh, in, in this space. Um, you know, we're already doing pretty well on that as well. I know we have one of the high proportions of uh, developers uh, uh, per person in the, uh, in, in, uh, you know, as, as a member of the population. Um, and, uh, and also um, third level institutions in Ireland have also taken a lead as well by developing uh, masters in blockchain, uh, which was actually one of the first uh, to be um, released and approved of. Um, and also many regional ITs in Ireland as well are developing diploma courses and certificates in, uh, in, in blockchain and uh, uh, ledger technology. Um, the next key uh, area which I, I think is, is worth addressing is the cross-pollination of uh, technology clusters in Ireland as well. So Ireland has been developing uh, significant cybersecurity clusters, reg tech clusters, insure tech clusters, as well as blockchain clusters. And as these tech, as these tech, as these subsectors of, there's going to be natural cross pollination between these. And this is something where IDA uh, seeks to facilitate these interactions by uh, hosting events, uh, facilitating introductions of firms that want to speak to uh, uh, either smaller uh, firms to, to form partnerships, um, or or potentially look at uh, acquisitions or making investments. So I, th I think that's another uh, key area. Thirdly, um, you know, we've had uh, Rowena talking about the quick transposition. Of, uh, of, of directives to uh, Irish relation as well. Um, I think this is very important. And uh, it's something which Ireland actually developed its competitive edge in financial services back in the 1980s, um, when they, uh, you know, when they really, when the CBI really prided itself on being one of the first EU countries to tra transcribe EU regulation into, uh, in, in Irish, uh, into, our, uh, into the Irish rulebook. Um, and then finally as well, um, I think it'd be interesting as well to continue to promote Ireland as a test bed for new products. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a relatively small island with a small population. So it's a very self-contained uh, ecosystem where, uh, you know, fintechs uh, roll out innovative products and, uh, and, and try them out here before then um, uh, expanding the, uh, 
these services to, uh, to, to larger markets. So I think it'd be a very interesting angle as well to help uh, attract and develop the FinTech ecosystem in the future. Thank you, everyone. I think we covered an awful lot of ground there. We've got a few minutes left. So if anybody in the audience has any questions you'd like to ask any of the panelists, there's a uh, button in the Zoom where you can ask, the, uh, it's called Q&A, where you can type in a question uh, and we'll try and get through as many as we can in the last few minutes of the talk. Uh, I'll just go and check, do we have any? Um, so there's, there's one come through from an an anonymous attendee for Column. Uh, it says there's a lot of talk about the future of identity and the move to a decentralized identity model. What are your thoughts on this and how has IDPAL been involved in that movement? Yeah, I think, I think it's definitely where it's going. It's all going to be about self-sovereign self identity and it's going to be about decentralization. Um, and I think it kind of goes back again to uh, maybe there was a theme in what I was saying throughout the last, throughout the last few comments around, around data and people and their personal data and want to control their own data. Um, we, we, we've been involved in a number of projects. Um, we're involved in a, in a blockchain project out, out in the Middle East around um, centralized data, around um, uh, cent centralized um, database for, for individuals' personal, personal identity. Um, we're also involved in a, in, a, in a large project in the United States um, with a company called Sherpa Technologies and um, MemberPass. Um, the whole idea there is that it's it's a blockchain credential sharing system, so you can go from one credit union to the next credit union um, without having to go through the, the, the current rigmarole that, that we're all well aware of that you have to go through. Um, and interestingly, I think as well, like you know, it's happening within pockets, and um, so every country seem, seems to be slightly different. Um, I'm not too sure if there's, there's many people aware here, but it's also happening in Ireland, and there's a project called Project Emerald, and someone was definitely wearing the green hat when they came up with the name. And that is that is the name, and it's it's very much about credential sharing. Um, you know, and that goes anything from your from your passport to your no claims bonus. It's it's across the board. And um, that beautiful idea that you could walk into an accountancy firm, a law firm, or a bank, um, and you don't you, every, everything's there. It's all in your wallet, and you control it. You own it, and then and then you share it. Um, I will say we're we're a long, long, long way from um, having anything like this. Um, I think Australia are probably um, at, at, at the forefront in terms of some of the kind of digital identity side of things, um, and that has come with their own problems. Um, they, they, they've released a, a wallet driver's license, so you no longer have a physical driver's license, um, but the legislation there is stating that to avail of a lot of services, you actually require a physical driver's license. Um, so then that's that balance between the between the, the business and, and the legislation again. But um, there's a long way to go on it, um, but it's, it's definitely the way, the way the market is moving. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Colin. Uh, so th there's an awful lot of questions on Brexit here, so I'll, I'll try and get through them. Um, and this is one probably for John and Byron. So John, maybe you can answer first and then Byron, you can answer as well. The question is, what are the specific impacts Brexit will have on fintech in Ireland and the EU? Yeah, look, um, if I knew the answer to that, I could retire um, tomorrow. I think, you know, as, from a personal data perspective, what I alluded to earlier is what I'm looking at. There's going to be huge impacts for personal data transfer into the UK. I I think it's very unlikely that the European Commission will grant an adequacy decision to the United Kingdom. That will mean that there will be some disruption to personal data flows from the EU to the UK. Um, I, you know, from the work that I'm doing currently, um, you know, we're, we're trying to future proof our operations. So, you know, we've transitioned uh, a lot of our EU customers to having their services provided from Lithuania. Um, as opposed to having them provided from London. We can't passport um, services through London anymore. So purely from my perspective, um, the future is very uncertain. It depends on a number of things for us, including how good relations are between the UK and the EU. I think there has to be a degree of pragmatism. I think there's going to be thousands of companies in this boat and dozens and dozens of fintech companies in this boat um, and it's much like after the Schrems decision where the Court of Justice of the European Union struck down a transfer mechanism to the United States there is safety in numbers um, and I certainly talked to my peers in our um, I'm going to say competitors but friendly rival banks to understand what the market standard is because there is no point reinventing the wheel. And you know, there's no point going out and spending hundreds of thousands of pounds to future-proof when we don't know what the future will look like. 
and Byron? So, um, yeah, I mean, just to echo um, what uh, John was saying there as well, and just to build upon it. Um, so, um, there, again, there's, you know, there's four areas here where, where I see there's going to be a significant impact. Um, first of all, when uh, speaking to UK fintechs as well, uh, see that uh, Bre has permanently altered their uh, go-to-market strategy for expanding into the EU. So historically, uh, a UK fintech, um, you know, they, they would have been maybe headquartered in London. They focus on acquiring clients in the domestic market in UK. And when they turn their attention to the EU, they, they would generally just passport out of the UK uh, to uh, start delivering their services across the block. Um, what's changed now is that they have to factor in a, a new EU headquarters somewhere within the EU. And, and that's where Ireland has a big opportunity because uh, you know, Ireland is, uh, you know, it's native English speaking common law jurisdiction, very close to the UK with a lot of uh, cultural links with tree. So it has a high degree of familiarity. And, you know, as such, it makes it a very straightforward uh, value proposition when, uh, when pitching for, uh, for having these EU headquarters established in Ireland. Um, you know, similarly as well, these are uh, fast moving cost sensitive companies as well. And, uh, you know, so they're generally very to the, uh, the support that IDA offers them. Uh, additionally, um, I mean, turning to the, you know, I know we talked a lot about regulation, but um, I mean, one element of, of regulation which could impact fintechs as well, both in the UK and Ireland as well, is the, uh, the possibility of um, outsourcing uh, operations uh, back to uh, headquarters. So uh, many, uh, many UK headquartered firms, they're setting up EU subsidiary in Ireland uh, a certain degree of outsourcing of their operations uh, continues to be uh, stuck to the EA, uh, but the European Commission now is actually, uh, you know, considering uh, how how permissible this is going to be post Brexit as well. I think a lot of this is on the current negotiations that are ongoing, um, and and there's a high degree of uncertainty surrounding that. Uh, similarly, as well, now once the UK has fully broken away from the EU, you may see that it's a, a kind of a significantly different path in terms of how, it, how regulation evolves. And this could prove to actually be quite costly then for fintechs in the EU to apply two different regulatory standards to uh, their, their EU client base and their UK client base as well and how to uh, uh, set, set up two different uh, regulatory uh, regimes. And, and then finally as well, from an inward investment perspective as well, um, you know, we're dealing, we're fielding a lot more requests from fintechs in uh, the US and Asia, Australia, South Africa, amongst other places. And, uh, you know, historically, they would have looked at the UK as the, the, their first port of call uh, when uh, looking to enter the EU to distribute, distribute their services across the block. But now they're finding that they can no longer do that. And, and as such, Ireland is receiving a lot more interest and a lot more international attention um, from uh, fintechs uh, from these jurisdictions. Rowena, we've got a, a couple of questions on the, the legal regulatory side. Uh, one from David Kindlin. Rowena, how are the CBI, uh, how long are the CBI taking to approve an open banking license? And another from an anonymous attendee, how is the central bank dealing with Brexit applications? Okay, th thanks, Mark. Yeah, those two are, I suppose, somewhat linked. So um, I think it's fair to say at the moment that the central bank is incredibly busy with, with Brexit, Brexit applications. You know, kind of towards March last year and the supposed deadline at that date, there was a huge flurry of activity uh, and many applicants were authorised by then. After that, there was a bit of a lull and I think it's fair to say we're now back in the full throes of it. Um, so there's a lot going on in terms of applicants at the moment. Um, to be fair, the Central Bank has very, been very consistent and firm in its position that, you know, it isn't a rubber stamp regulator and it's not going to authorise the box entities. That's it for the postal analogies now, but for them, substance is a key requirement. So you're not going to get your license in Ireland unless you've bodies on the ground um, and that you can meet the, the central bank substance requirements. And given the looming deadline of 31 December this year, which is looking like a very, very real deadline this time, this time around, I expect that we're going to see a lot of firms authorised before year end. And just to touch on just timings, um, just to answer David's question. The central bank at the moment is safe. It's just a payments license you're looking for. You're probably looking at between nine and 12 months to get your license in place. If you're looking at a full banking license, so not just payments, but you've got your deposit taking add-ons, you're probably looking at in excess of 12 months. As I said, there's a lot of work that goes with getting a license from the central bank and there's a lot of responsibility that goes with that. So you know, you'd have to factor in the time it takes to prepare the application 
and then once it's in with the central bank, the, the back and forth with the central bank before they're happy to authorise it. Thanks, Rowena. Um, I think we're just about out of time, so I'm sorry we didn't get to, to go through all of the questions. Um, to those of you who put your name down to the questions, um, I'll pass those on to the panellists and uh, we'll, we'll try and, and get back to you if we can. Um, it was a really interesting session, I thought, um, and I hope that you as the audience have taken away some helpful information from what the panellists have said. For me, it was interesting to hear, to hear um, how positive the outlook for the fintech landscape in Ireland and the EU is, despite the challenges that we know are there. Um, we heard from Wina about the balancing act between financial services regulation on one hand and trying to protect users in the financial services system on the other hand. Um, Colm talked to us about artificial intelligence, the fact that it's already here, but hopefully it won't just replace humans qu quite yet. Um, and John talked about the reality that all fintechs deal with data. So GDPR needs to be in the DNA of your company when you're launching products right at the start and get that specialist advice. I'd just like to thank all of our panelists, Byron Fry from the IDA, Colin Lyons from IDPAL, John O'Brien from Revolut and our very own Rowena Fitzgerald from Mason, Hayes and Curran. Thank you to all of you for attending. It was a real pleasure to have your company. My name is Mark Adair. Our website is mhc.ie and all of the details, uh, contact details for the panelists will be up on our website after this webinar. So all that's left for me to say is thank you very much for attending and have a great afternoon. Thank you.